Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and thank you for tuning in to Mineral Talks Live. Today is Wednesday, February 24th, the last Wednesday of February 2021. It was just about one year ago today when all of us had finally returned home from Tucson and we've barely seen each other since then. That makes us especially happy that you've joined us today on our 36th episode of Mineral Talks Live. Mineral Talks Live is the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Swoboda, the president of Blue Cap Productions, and together with my exceptional partners, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez from the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou from the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP, we're very happy to have you with us. Our goal in producing this program has always been to bring together all the different facets of our mineral world, from curators and curatrix to collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and the media that serves us all. We're quickly approaching one year since we've all been separated, and this show is one small way to keep us connected to each other. Raquel, Eloise, and I try our best to bring a wide range of guests onto the show, and in doing so, we feel that the show reflects the true global nature of our mineral world. In the time since we've been airing, we've had guests and viewers from all different parts of the world. Now, as a viewer, you too are plugged into this global network. This isn't just a live broadcast, it's an interactive broadcast. So your participation during the show helps to make the show what it is. So throughout the show, you can interact with us and you can also interact with each other. There are two ways that you can do this. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of buttons. There's one button labeled chat and another labeled Q&A. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. So when you first sign on, feel free to fire off a chat message to everyone telling us where in the world you're tuning in from. Also, if you have thoughts or comments about things you're seeing in the show, this is how you can share with others. Even if it's just a ooh or an ah, that's what makes the show alive. And so just so that you understand, during the interview, our guests now pretty much be focused on our conversation and not really looking at the chat window. However, both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments along with everyone else's. When they feel it's appropriate, either Raquel or Eloise may tune on their, turn on their mics and address us directly with questions that you're asking so we can get an immediate answer from our guests while they're still on the topic. Now, the second way to interact is with the Q&A function. This allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the very end of the interview. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you may see a window pop up on your screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. This is just a bit of fun that we like to have with our guests and with each other. Now, our guests have not seen these questions. So to us, it's always fun to see their reactions as we also try to predict how they'll answer. Now, our guest for today is a mineral dealer all of you know. The exquisite minerals he consistently brings to the mineral shows makes him one of the most popular interviews on the What's Hot in Tucson series. However, it's not his inventory as a mineral dealer that brings him on today's show. No, nope. in 2018, this man stepped up to the plate and took a swing at something most people believed was a wild pitch. He opened a mineral gallery in the art district of Chelsea, New York, and that's in Manhattan. His belief was that if minerals were exhibited in much the same way that fine art was exhibited, that people would notice. And he was 100% correct. People did notice. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome the Babe Ruth of the mineral world to our show, Mr. Stuart Walensky. Stu, how are you doing, buddy? Hey, Brian. Very good. Great to be here. Thank you. So happy that you can join us, man. And you are coming to us live from your gallery, correct? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, where we are uh, closed right now. We're by appointment only due to the virus. But yes, we are here and we do have an exhibition on at the moment. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Now, Stu, I always like to turn back the clock a bit with our guests to learn about how they first got involved in mineral collecting. You're such a well-known and respected fine mineral dealer. But when did the passion for minerals first get sparked? So I've been doing this um, close to 40 years now. 
And uh, the story goes where I encountered minerals at a flea market, bought a couple of quartz crystals from Arkansas, brought them home, and literally fell in love with minerals. And from that moment on, it was the never ending quest to find out more about minerals. It was really, I think, a, a, a story that many dealers can tell you. We start out as collectors, we start out passionately about minerals, and then we realize, well, to collect minerals, we have to be able to afford minerals, and then we kind of slide into dealing in minerals. And then uh, about 10 years in, we decided, my wife and I, that this was the profession that we wanted to pursue, and we did. And uh, it all started from that quartz crystal at a flea market on Long Island, actually. Now, do you still have that quartz crystal? No, I wish I did. <laughs> I do have some <laughs> minerals from the first couple of years of my collecting, but not that piece, no. no. Okay. And so from mineral dealer to gallery owner, tell yeah. us about the inspirations that led you down this path and why you feel it's important to be doing both. So over the past 35 years, I've had many loyal and consistent customers. Usually our clients stick with us for decades and we build them large collections of fine minerals. But how do you acquire new collectors? Where do you find new people to come into the market? How do we attract people who are not familiar with mineral collecting? And of course, shows are nice, but again, you have to kind of know that the shows exist. Mineral magazines are great, but you have to know they exist. And about 10 years ago, my oldest son, Troy, joined me in, in the mineral business. And we did shows and the conventional way of selling minerals. And then about five years ago, my younger son decided he would like to also join us. And I said, well, it's time to expand. It's time to look elsewhere and outside of the classic, typical mineral collecting community. And I've always been involved in the art world. I started out in the antique and art business with my dad when I was a kid. Uh, I went to... Uh, college and studied art history. I have a master's degree in art history. So I've always had an interest in art and how art and minerals are really very closely related. So we talked this over and we said, it's time to open a gallery. And being we live pretty close to New York City and New York City is the center of the art world. We decided that this was where we were gonna open up the gallery. Um, here in Chelsea, in the, this is the art district of New York. We are surrounded by no less than 300 art galleries, wow. uh, large and small. Right down the street are some of the biggest art galleries in the world. Uh, some people may know the names, Gagosian, Warner, Hauser & Wirth, uh, Pace Gallery. These are the largest art dealers in the world, and they are our neighbors. And here we are in the center, the only mineral gallery in the area. And we really find it fascinating how people are attracted to what we do and they quickly equate it to art because to them, they're, they are works of art. They're works of aesthetic beauty. So still walk us through that whole process of um, kind of the, um, the exchange that you have with people who come in. They walk by your gallery. They see it. They say, wow, what is that? They come in. Just kind of expand that a little bit just so that we can understand. Well, I'm sure many people have experienced people who are not familiar with minerals, we get a lot of, wow, how did you make these? <laughs> or you're very good at making these. And when you have the discussion, no, they're natural. They come out, the, out of the ground looking like this. This is all nature's creations. We have very little to do with how they look. It's a fascinating transformation from this is interesting to this is amazing. And Everyone who walks in here literally leaves, like with a new way of looking at the world, that these things are kind of beneath our feet and have been for the, for millennium. And here they are on display in a gallery and it changes the way they see the minerals, it changes the way they see art. And I think the two together really work out nicely. Everyone really has, we have very positive experience with everyone who walks in here, whether they buy something or not, doesn't matter. It's a great experience to see their eyes open up about something that they were totally unfamiliar with. 
No, oh, that, that is wonderful. And I know that the photography plays a large part in, um, uh, in projecting that image, especially with the catalogs. And just for the viewers out there, stay tuned to the very end because we're going to have a special get a giveaway, not getaway, giveaway, <laughs> getaway. Oh, wow. And Stu's like, no, 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 I didn't promise that. <laughs> okay. So, Stu, thus far, uh, Blue Cat viewers have been able to see what you did with the Emerald exhibit in 2019, the Photos yeah. Tears exhibit. Uh, they've also received a sneak peek at the Quartz exhibit in What's Hot in Tucson 2020, yeah. as well as a peek uh, at the upcoming Inclusions exhibit in right. our live broadcast of What's Hot in Tucson 2021. Right now, what you have set up at the gallery is the Contrast exhibit. Why don't you kind of take us through and show us what so, this exhibit is? For each exhibition, we produce a color catalog there, as well as you can see it on our website. And the contrast exhibit followed a different exhibit. Let me just open up a couple of pages here just to give you some idea of what our catalogs look like. Uh, we're trying, we're again, very much trying to emulate the art world while still being uh, mineral collector, mineral dealers. And what these catalogs do is that they're a permanent record of the exhibition. So the Emerald exhibition from uh, which you filmed and it was fantastic, by the way, um, Thank you. That was really more of an educational exhibition where we had many of the world's greatest emeralds on display from private collectors and from museums. The contrast exhibit and our previous exhibit, which was called Underground Use, and again, you know, a similar type of catalog with full color photos. So these two exhibits really followed a concept that we developed after we opened the gallery. And the concept was this, it's called, and I, it's very egotistical of us to say this, but it's called the Walensky approach. And mm. why did we design this little booklet? Because people would walk into the gallery, collectors and non-collectors, and really have difficulty understanding the differences between good minerals, great minerals, exceptional minerals, all these things, how do you quantify it? So we developed a system where you go through each mineral that you own or look at, and you can have a one to 10 numbering system. And then at the end, you add it up, you divide it by the number of criteria that you used, and you come up with a, a number between one and 10 for your mineral. And so in this Walensky approach, color, which was the underground use, and contrast are very important criteria. So we developed these exhibitions based on this criteria system, which you will also find in the contrast catalog. In the back, we also, somewhere in the back here, I know we did, we put the system so that people can use it. You'll have to trust me on that, that it's in here somewhere. Um, so those were the, that, that was the, the idea of these exhibits, was to help people understand the differences between aesthetic minerals and how to determine which ones they should add to their collections and which ones maybe don't belong in their collections. Uh, and these, I would like to call really selling exhibits. Whereas the mm -hmm. Emerald exhibit that you talked about earlier was more of an educational exhibit. The Quartz exhibit, and we were supposed to do it actually last September, but due to the virus, we couldn't. We're trying to figure out a date for that soon. That will be also pieces borrowed from private collections and museums, and it'll be primarily a educational exhibit. And the same with the inclusion exhibit. That's one collection, and it'll be on display, uh, and it will be exhibited by itself. So, so that, the difference is, Stu, is that some of the exhibits, the pieces are available for sale, and some, like the Emerald, they are just almost uh, reference, almost more like visiting a museum, correct? Exactly. It's closer to a museum exhibit. And our plan is to do one museum-type exhibit a year. We're going to do four exhibitions per year. One will be a museum type and three will be selling ex exhibitions. Mm. And all of them are gonna have associated catalogs with that Absolutely. as a reference back to yes. what was exhibited, correct? Right, the catalogs will always be here, both online and in printed form. You can purchase them from our website in printed form if you like. And uh, I, I know that a lot of people have commented on the style of photography that we're doing. And I wish I could take credit for it. I love photographic minerals, but this is all due to our 
new photographer who works for us full time. He's part of our team. Called Evan. His name is Evan Garpino, and he is now uh, a part of Bolensky Exquisite Minerals. And we have a design team that also works with us on these catalogs. And we really are trying to produce catalogs that not only mineral collectors can appreciate, but everyone can look at and appreciate and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Now, Stu, let me go back to your list of criteria. You mentioned that color and contrast were two of the criteria that yes. are in that uh, kind of uh, a fold away document. Can you quickly read through the other characteristics of minerals that you've put on there so that people kind of understand a little bit more the whole Walensky method? Right. So this, so the Walensky approach is considered, it's not, it's not about a dollar value on your mineral. This is purely how to judge an aesthetic mineral quality of a mineral, the aesthetic quality of a mineral. So the, we have two sections, sections A and B. And so A would be color, transparency, luster, form and definition, and crystal size. And then B is contrast, balance, aesthetics, and perfection. And then each one of these criteria has a short description so you understand mm -hmm. what it is you're looking for. What we would like to also uh, explain to people is that if you're not an experienced collector, we're happy to go through this with you and, to, and show you how to use the system. If you're an experienced collector, most people would know what all these terms mean. And then we have a small glossary on the back that explains it to the amateur. So we get a lot of, because we're in the middle of the city and we're right on 10th Avenue, we get a lot of people in here who literally have never even looked at a mineral. And then mm -hmm. they ask a lot of questions. And this, we're hoping, will answer a lot of those questions for them. Uh, and they can take this home with them and study it. And if they choose to become a mineral collector, it may very well help them, uh, you know, with their collecting abilities. And the catalogs, of course, will serve the same purpose. Well, really, hats off to you, Stuart, because this is the first time I've seen a system proposed to the mineral collecting world that tries to educate people on different characteristics of what makes a mineral uh, 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 valuable, or not really valuable, but what makes a mineral great. Probably right. the closest thing we've ever got to this was the Icons book that Wayne Thompson did through the Mineralogical Record. Absolutely. But this is, what you've done is kind of independent of particular specimens, and it's really trying to educate people on the different uh, criteria right. that we all understand. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, I believe I've seen this online. Uh, I want to say on our website. Facebook page. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not honestly not sure if it's on, on Facebook, but it is on our website, and it's actually you can uh, you can do it. it. It'll calculate it all for you on the website and put in the numbers, and then it will actually calculate your final uh, number. Or as as Troy is telling me from behind the camera that that's coming soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> It is on the website. You can at least look at it. <laughs> right. And I'm just going to pop this up real quick. The website is walenskyminerals.com. Right. And you can, you can order our catalogs from the website. They're always on there. All right, Stu, take us into the exhibit. Let's, let's, let's take a look at contrast. Okay, great. So I'm going to just have to come around and get the camera, and then we'll walk around and we'll see the exhibit. Okay, so the reason we just went off and I'll get you back onto Zoom. Okay, there we go. So this is our new office. When Brian, when you were here, this room was kind of empty and it was uh, designed by a wonderful friend of ours who is a world famous architect and his name is Antonio Saracino and Antonio uh, lives here in New York and he's a collector as well. And he designed this for us, built this for us. Uh, we're still working on it. It's about 90% done. And here on this wall, you can see these light boxes, which line the wall uh, with LED panels behind the pieces and LED lights on top. And these uh, will also, we will be offering to collectors as well, if they'd like them for their home. Um, the cabinets will be filled with minerals at some point in the future. Right now we're still working on them, but this is all designed by Antonio. And even the mineral table, Antonio does furniture inspired by minerals. That is great. And uh, we will have this all ready for anyone who'd like to visit. And 
As you can see on our back wall is our library of mineralogical records, which we're always proud of. And I'll walk you through the gallery. So leaving the office, and this is our front entrance way, and that's 10th Avenue with the construction on our tent, on our front of us, which has been there for a year. <laughs> and there's Troy. And here we're developing a uh, new uh, design as well for uh, people in their, their mineral library and these small light boxes, which again, Antonio is developing for us for collectors to put individual specimens in. So we're very happy with these new display concepts that he's working on. Those are cool. And we're very proud of our, our front desk. <laughs> <laughs> and then this gallery is often a place where we put larger specimens on display just as people walk in so they can enjoy them uh, before they get into the exhibit. Right now it's a little bit empty because of COVID. We don't have a lot of people coming in. And then this uh, curtain, which you see here, we call our black room. This is where our exhibits begin. And I know that right now all you're seeing are white, looks like white dots because of the intensity of light, but just giving you an idea. So when you walk in the room, this is what you see. You see the semicircle of cases, and this is our contrast exhibit. I, I know, Brian, we talked about getting some photos up that you have, and this is case number one. And this is, um, I can get pretty close to the minerals and they look pretty good, I think. If you'll tell me if that looks good to you, that azurite from Lopilas. It does look good. I've got an image of it up on my screen, but uh, you know, it really shows the beauty of it. But I think there's a lot to be said for what we're seeing on your live camera. Yes, you can really capture a lot of the, the beauty of it on, uh, on live video. This is the fluorite on quartz from the Yaogan Jian mine in China. And again, these are all in the catalog. They're all on our website as well. A fantastic fluorite from Illinois, where the bottom two thirds is all yellow fluorite, and then the top is a bluish purple cube that grew as a second generation. So well no, known. I'm gonna, excuse me. I'm going to ask. Uh, okay, I'm going to spotlight my screen because we got a close-up shot of that uh, fluorite right here, where you see the two distinct color uh, areas, and you see the zoning in the blue fluorite. Fantastic. All right. And here Back is a piece from the Diana Marie mine in uh, Mirdale, which I think many of you are now familiar with. This is, this is one of those very unusual pockets where it was on white calcite, so it really shows off the green fluoride. And again, you can see from these four specimens, the concept we're going for is mostly contrast in color, but we're also going for contrast in texture, as well as luster, and even in some cases, mineral, the, the, the contrast between different minerals. So contrast can mean more than just a uh, different color, well, you, know, you know, blue on white or purple on white. And we do explain that in the catalog. And now moving over to case number two. I know that this short of sign from Sweet Home is a little bit, a little bit bright there in the center, uh, but I think you can still appreciate the beautiful hues, actually gem quality hues of, of red vertebrosite. I think you have the wrong roto up, Brian. Oh that's yeah, no, right. I do have the wrong. Yeah, the wrong that's one okay. Up. We'll get to that roto at the end. That's in the last case, actually. And here is a, a fairly recent rodenite out of Brazil. And again, it's a little bit blown out by the light, but it is just absolutely incredible gem red on a black matrix. I'm gonna ask to jump to my screen so that we can see the true color of the crystal there because yeah, there ahead. it looks like it, yeah, there we go. Yeah. That is the piece there, just killer. You know, killer. in person, the colors and the lights are, are very easy to see, but as you know, um, camera on a phone can only do so much. Like the next piece is really unfortunately blown out because it's white calcite on dock case. So you might want to bring up that photo. It really doesn't do it justice, uh, what we're seeing on screen, at least what I'm seeing. 
I know you've got a close up of it because a, this is an unusual piece in that, you know, we're, we're also familiar with uh, dioptase on calcite, but calcite on dioptase is actually quite unusual, quite rare. Mm. Next is an old piece from China. Uh, you'll probably a lot of the collectors who've been around a while will remember when these came out. The, uh, these are uh, beautifully twinned yellow calcites on stibnite. It was a one-time occurrence, and this was about, I'm going to guess, about 15 years or more, and never seen again. And the calcites are just fa fabulous quality with great definition, and again, great contrast of yellow against the silvery black salarite, oh, excuse me, stibnite. And now case number three has one of the more recent Russian tourmalines. This is a beautiful trident uh, of crystals on a white quartz matrix with a wonderful jemmy crystal right laying across the front. Yeah, we've cut to the photograph that I have of the good, piece. Good. And that truly shows the proper color. Yes, those Russian yes. Tourmalines. It's fantastic. Yeah, the color on these tourmalines, as uh, many of you know, ranges from sort of a, uh, a real ruby red, uh, rubellite red to a purple, sometimes to a pink purple, and the centers are often green, uh, which comes out more in the actually in the showcase than it does even in the photo. When you look at this piece or any of them in with less light, they look red like you would expect from a rubellite from uh, Jonas. Mm. And now onto case number four. Actually, Brian, you don't have a photo of this piece. Uh, that was my error. I didn't get that to you. But this is a South Dakota barite. It's a gem crystal on a yellow calcite matrix. But I think it's coming through pretty well on the video, if I'm correct. It looks fantastic. That's one of those classic, uh, um, was it Elk, Elk Grove? Elk Creek. Uh, Elk, Elk Creek. Creek. Barite. Correct. And, um, you know, many of your viewers probably know that these come out of concretions, and it's it, it fascinates me personally because when you look at a concretion, all you see is this gray exterior, but inside is this hidden beauty. Hey Stu, can you put a finger next to that uh, that main crystal just to give us a sense of scale? I mean, sure. that's huge. Yeah, that's huge and it's incredible. It's a cabinet, size, it's a cabinet size piece. I'm. I know all the measurements are in the catalog, but I'm going to guess it's about four inches, four and a half inches across. Wow. And I know we now measure things in centimeters in the catalog, but I'm a little bit old, so <laughs> <laughs> inches are still easier for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a, uh, a nice old sheolite from China. Again, orange on a silvery muscovite matrix. Uh, these, again, were old, came out probably about 15 years ago. This one had been in a collection until the day we bought it. Beautiful uh, octahedrons uh, on this uh, very nice contrasting white matrix. And then uh, this is an orpiment on calcite, also from China. And you can see the theme running through where everything is a very high contrast, strong colors against lighter colors and vice versa. And this, I'm going to cut uh, back to my image of that, Stu, just because uh, the bottom half of that is kind of obscured in the shadows, but um, yes. when you see it in its full glory, you really appreciate it for what it yes. is. I mean, these are literally gem crystals of orpiment, which is such a rarity with white calcite. Okay, now we will move on to the next showcase, which only has one specimen in it, but it's quite special. Uh, this is uh, this is from a recent find. It was talked about in the MR a few issues ago. I can't say which one, but about three issues ago, where they had the that gigantic, fantastic aqua on the cover. And this pocket was from the same mine, but this was aquamarine with red specertines. That is just so great. Now it's a discovery. You know, we've seen aquamarine with red specertines before. But I've never seen any where the specimens are this quality, this intensity, and this kind of coverage. This piece is very large, measures at least 14 inches across, and it is almost as if the whole pocket were taken out at once. Yeah. 
Now, Stu, I'm going to cut back to my screen here yeah. because we've got a close-up shot. Uh, it's a vertical shot that shows yeah. the uh, the two major or the three major aquamarine crystals there, and it's just, I mean, really right. talking about contrast. That just that smacks you in the face. Yes, exactly. As Wilbur would like to say, it's like smacking your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> that sounds like Dave. All right, nobody understands what he says. <laughs> a point <laughs> now you'll notice too that the minerals are displayed with the same backgrounds that you will see in the catalog we try to do the display to emulate the catalog uh, because it worked so nicely actually Stuart we have a question from the audience uh, can yes. you tell us more about those blocks those symmetrical blocks that you're using so the blocks really were uh, they were created by our photographer and he he literally just decided that that would be what he envisioned as a contrasting display. Uh, so you have these very sharply uh, angled blocks that he created out of wood and painted them different colors to, to enhance the contrast concept uh, of the minerals. And as I said, Evan, who is our photographer, he, he, is a, he comes from a, a world where um, yeah, really the advertising world. So he sees things in a different way than maybe we would as mineral collectors. And so he's developed some very interesting concepts and techniques that work very nicely for the display of minerals. I can't tell you how refreshing it is, Stuart, because I'm so used to seeing just the minerals floating in space. Right. And, you know, I my eyes are just dying for something new and this, this right. is certainly providing it. Yeah, and, and Evan has done a fantastic job. And like I say, because he comes from a very different uh, angle at this, his art direction is completely unrelated to how we have seen the mineral world for the last 25 years. Which is what yeah, we Yeah, I think need. people love it. It's, it's really different. It's really nice to see like, something around the minerals and around the worlds of minerals so um you have a lot of uh, a lot of good um, feedback from the audience here right i agree i i, I definitely agree now so, so before you move on i'm going to go back yeah. to that uh, pyrite back there i've got a yeah. close-up shot on my screen so that people yeah. can really see the details and i think it's important to see that it, it's a wonderful uh, unusual pyrite from china it's sort of like balls of pyrite on a glistening white quartz matrix. I, I have not seen many of these uh, ever. Uh, this was kind of new to us, this whole, uh, the, the, the find. I don't know if there were more of them, but we've only seen two. I love this. It has such a kind of dynamic fluid look to it when you get really close to it, that it just, it engages your eyes and your imagination. It's wonderful. Absolutely. And when just uh, to when Evan does a close up, it's not like he crops out a piece from a bigger photo. He actually does each photo individually, and that probably accounts for the sharpness and the definition that we're seeing in the photograph. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yes. And here is an aquamarine with shoral and quartz. Again, extreme uh, differences in color and texture. This piece is um, interesting, which I, I, many of you will remember the Joe Freilich collection, and this was illustrated both in the mineralogical record uh, edition of his collection as well as the auction catalog. And yeah, this there it is back on my screen, uh, not as blown out as we're seeing it on your video. Right. Uh, but we're also seeing it in in relation to the contrasting wood background. That's just it's wonderful, it's so engaging. And here is an Arsino pyrite from China, which I, I think you have Evans close up as well. But the 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 coloration that has formed as a thin film over the Arsino pyrite is just outstanding. It, it it just makes this piece way beyond what you think of when you think of Arsino pyrite. Yeah, yeah, here we have it up on the screen now. Look yeah. at that. Yeah, it's just the uh, dazzling colors. You know, I think sometimes these extreme close-ups like this becomes almost an abstract art 
in itself. And I, I love these. I mean, I could, I could totally picture this on a wall and people would be saying, what is that? Just as a, uh, as a way to engage people and strike up conversation. Oh, absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. And uh, the, the next piece is a pyrite and calcite from Peru, but of extreme sharpness and extreme luster. And again, I believe I sent you a close up of this. I hope I did that Evan did because it's quite amazing. Yes, you did. Yeah, there it is there right it is. there. Yeah, you can just appreciate it so much more. Uh, the white calcite gets blown out on the video, unfortunately. I mean, again, we've all seen so much pyrite, but you've just shown us two excellent examples of pyrite that kind of are different than what we're normally used to seeing. And each in its own way is absolutely incredibly beautiful. Well, thank you. And the next case here, we're seeing again, another one of the more recent Russian tourmalines. When I say recent, uh, a lot of people may not understand that a lot of these came out uh, a couple of years ago, but they didn't make it to the market for a while. So recent in the sense of that we're familiar with them. Um, and this is a single crystal of uh, tourmaline with a crossing white crystal of quartz going around along the back, just an incredible aesthetic piece, again, with high contrast. So what, now, again, I'm going to pull that up on, on my that. screen. On that specimen, can can you put your hand so we can get an idea oh, yes, of the size? I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well. yeah, you can kind of get a feeling for the size of it. And I've pulled up on my screen again a image of that that you sent me that shows a more accurate representation of the color of it. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And. You may also um, see, we don't, in this exhibition, there are no uh, bases for the minerals. Everything is uh, seeded by itself. We do prop them up occasionally, but we are trying to have people focus on the mineral and not on the label or the base. And Whenever someone's in the exhibit, we're with them, someone's with them to explain where the mineral's from, what the mineral is. And we just feel like we want to be a little bit closer here in the gallery to the art world and, and things are displayed without information and without basis. Now that, that may seem very odd to the mineral world at first, but we do, uh, we do find that the general public responds to it very well. And oh, and that's a credite on fluorite from Mexico. And right behind it is what I like to call the mini snail. It's a the snailette. Yes, the snailette, exactly. It was where the, if, if the snail had a baby, there, there she is. <laughs> and of course, it's I pulled up on my screen a photograph of the snailette and, um, you know, a lot of the qualities that we know so well from uh, Larson's snail. Somebody asked the question. Yeah, and I'm having a little bit of trouble again with the rotos, but because they get blown out. But this roto is a roto with tetrahedrite from the Sweet Home Mine. But the tetrahedrite is actually really the the attraction here, is because the tetrahedrites are so well formed and so large. And of course, accompanied by rhodochrosite, it only makes it even that much uh, more interesting. Wow. And then I've got the photo of that up on my screen so that we can see the true color of the piece. I'm sorry, Brian. I was, um, I, we just had a question related to the small snail and someone yeah. was asking yeah. if uh, it came from the same locality as uh, the big snail. Absolutely. They're both from the Schwanning and we can't prove it, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were from the same pocket. Thank you. And then we have this trio of, of specimens here. So we have the roto back here, which is this, the sweet home piece. And then towards the front, we have this very unusual roto from Peru uh, with very large crystals. Some of the largest crystals that we've seen from Peru from Uchaqua. And uh, it's an old piece. It's on uh, sort of a black matrix with white quartz. 
And the color on my screen isn't coming through as well as I'd like. It's more of an orangey red than, than red, but um, Brian, I know, has a, a photo of this piece, which I think represents it better than I can. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. So you can see the red and the orange in it, just absolutely beautiful mix of colors there. Exactly. And then the last piece in this case is from China. It is one of the hematite quartzes on hematite. And you may remember when these came out, again, um, very old in comparison to other pieces uh, from China that are more recent. Uh, the quartzes are really beautiful orange red and they sit on a black matrix of hematite. Now, um, I've got an image of it up on my screen that uh, we can cut to so people can see the colors there. It looks a little bit more red on my screen, a little bit more orange on the video. Yeah, you know, so much of that depends upon the temperature of the light that we use. So, okay. you know, for any of those who are interested in, in color rendition, you know, the warm light will bring out the orange, where sometimes the cold light will bring out the red. But the reality is it's both colors, depending upon which light you look at. It. Sure. Yeah. Now, Stu, as you move to the next uh, case, I'm yeah. going to ask uh, Eloise and Raquel to go ahead and launch the poll. We're about 40 minutes into the interview. So now would be the time. And you might have to close that on your screen so that it doesn't block your view. Right. I'm okay. allowed to read the questions. Yeah. Got it. Got it. <laughs> so, uh, Brian, would you like me to continue, though, with the cases? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, here we have uh, a fantastic tourmaline on quartz from Pediera. It's from the Grand Don pocket. Uh, some people may be familiar with the fantastic Grand Don piece that's at the Houston Museum that's about 10 times the size of this piece. And we're just opening the case to get a better view of it. And you can see the fantastic gem quality of these crystals, which Pedniera is so famous for. But I find Pedniera is just as important that the quality of the quartz is just as important as the quality of the tourmaline from that mine. Interesting. I've never heard anyone say that about Pedanera, but I don't disagree with you at all. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the quartz from Pedanera, especially on a piece like this, it really approaches the quality of Arkansas uh, for its clarity and its brilliance. And when you match that with the color and clarity and the intensity of color of tourmaline, I think that Pedanera vies for the spot for maybe finest tourmalines in the world. Yeah. As a, as a strong lover of blue caps, uh, obviously, I totally agree with your uh, evaluation of Petanera, nevertheless. Absolutely. And so the, uh, to the right of the tourmaline, we have a little grouping of uh, minerals. Uh, at the very bottom here, we have an inosite from China. Again, an older Chinese piece. This was one of the rare, rare examples that came out on clear quartz. And the quality of the inosite is as about as good as I've ever seen, a beautiful red-orange color. This piece was once part of the Steve Smale collection years ago. Mm. And you can see the quality that Steve, and we all know Steve Smale's quality is always exceptional. Now, Steve would always collect a mineral if it was uh, as perfect as he could find it, 360 yeah. degrees, correct? Right. Uh, he definitely loved 360, and of course, uh, he loves a great horizon, as he calls it, and I agree with that. His assessment is, I mean, Steve, Steve, Steve understood aesthetic minerals pretty much before any of us understood aesthetic minerals. And so, yes, uh, we all learned a lot from his, uh, his method, let me call it the Steve Smale method, yes. Yeah. So I, I, I think if you know it's from, a, from the Smale collection, you could look at like the angle that you're showing us now and you know that it's equally as good on the back. And Absolutely. that's an important yes. thing to, to, to recognize. And here's a really fascinating piece. This is a main appetite from uh, the, uh, you think I would know that off the top of my head, from Pulsar for Quarry, of course. Now this it's piece- It's that age from, thing, Stu. Yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> uh, 
but it's got the top color. It's on white quartz. It's it's more or less a thumbnail specimen, and it uh, it comes from two collections that are uh, are very well known. Or one, you know, for sure. I mean, I hope everyone remembers the Kelmans, um, Roz and uh, again an old thing. <laughs> Roz and Norm. Roz and Norm Kelman are you know, great people. I, I knew them very well, and uh, this was once theirs. And then a very good friend of mine, this was also David Shorsh's, and I think a lot of you know David as well. Stuart, will you be, uh, be careful, be mindful of your microphone in the phone? I think sometimes get blocked so we don't hear you properly. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that, is Thank that you. Yes. yes. Okay. So I hope everyone heard my whole speech about Norman Ros Bellman and David Shorsh owning this fantastic purple appetite from Maine. And you know, I'm sure, how few of these exist. And lastly, in this case, is a very unusual malachite. And it is what I would call primary malachite, because it's not pseudomorphing anything. And uh, it's on a quartz matrix. And this is from the Congo, one of the very few I've ever seen on a quartz matrix. And we'll move on to. Well, no, we're not moving on to anywhere because that's the last case. <laughs> that's the final case. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if anyone has questions about I, any of the know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Stuart. This is Eloise talking. Um, just a question. Are the blocks always the same height? So it gives a nice sense of scale there? Well, Do they have the same um, enough? Yeah, Evan designed them so that they would all be similar and Right, so that you can, yes, and then to answer your question is basically there's like two sizes and it does give you some sense of scale. So here, if you just see this piece is probably about maybe four inches tall. And then you've got the, uh, the malachite, which is probably about two, two and a quarter inches across. And then the small little appetite, which is a little, maybe an inch tall, a little bit over an inch. Right, so that makes sense. Yeah, the base yeah. is always the same size. So right. like that's oh, that does help. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that's answer most, mostly we uh, managed to answer all the questions that they were coming. So I invite people if they had more questions to uh, to let us know. I had a question from Ashley. I didn't get it completely. Um, she's asking um, when is the next edition of Wilinski Fine Minerals will be published? So, um, are we talking about, there are various, so about two years ago, we changed the name of the company from Walensky Fine Minerals to Walensky Exquisite Minerals when we moved to New York and opened the gallery. So we still go under the name, and I, a lot of people still call us Walensky Fine Minerals, which is understandable. Um, I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're actually Walensky Exquisite Minerals, but nonetheless, now, when are, is, is, is she talking about which book? Now, the books that I've produced that are archival books or exhibition catalogs? You know, I'm uh, guessing that she's talking about your, your photo books, your hard, uh, hard okay. cover photo books. So the, but I'm the, not sure. the archival books that I've produced over the years, uh, we just finished the last volume, and those can all be purchased through the Mineralogical Record Bookstore. And the reason we do that is... They, they get to keep all the money. So it's my donation to the mineralogical record. Um, we stopped selling them directly and gave them all to the min record so that they can reap the benefits of whatever, you know, wh whatever they sell, they keep. So if, uh, if you go to their bookstore online, you will definitely find all the volumes there and uh, you're welcome and, and to buy them from them. And I'm, I'm more than happy when I hear people buying them from them. Uh, we are now on our website just selling exhibition catalogs that relate to the current exhibition. And we're doing that also just so people don't get confused about what the gallery does as versus what I had done in the past uh, producing those volumes. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks, uh, Stuart. And Ashley is responding. Uh, we have volume one to six uh, of the hardcover. So I guess it's... Yes. Uh, yeah. Volume uh, seven so can... It is is a volume seven can be purchased directly from the min record. Yes. 
Excellent, thank you. Uh, so I have two questions related to more the, the specimens that you're exhibiting. The first from Dan is, do you collect fluid inclusions? And the second one was related to a fluorescent specimens. So uh, do you have anything on display with fluid inclusions or fluorescent minerals? So we don't, uh, we do have fluid inclusions that we don't own. That's part of the inclusion collection that will be on display in the future. Uh, here at the gallery, the one that we talked about uh, during the Tucson uh, live talk, uh, or Tucson, um, the... the uh, What's hot in Tucson? Come on, Alzheimer. Right, yeah, for sure. And so if, if you go back and, and look at that, you'll see the inclusions. I didn't show any fluid inclusions, but there are some in the collection. We don't have any available at this time. No, unfortunately, we do not. Okay, thank you. And for, and for uh, those Kathy, viewers, if you go to the Blue Cat Productions YouTube page, there is a playlist for What's Hot in Tucson 2021 that shows the interviews of the different sponsors. And Stuart was one of the sponsors. Uh, he's been a longtime sponsor of What's Hot in Tucson. And so you can actually go back, look at that exhibit you see, or look at that interview. It has some of the pieces, um, a lot of the pieces from the inclusion uh, exhibit and truly it blew people's minds for days afterwards i got emails from people saying oh my god i can't believe what i saw with walensky's interview so uh, yeah, take a look. I, I was i was actually brian so pleased that people enjoyed that um i was actually taken aback lots of people contacted me too and said wow that was amazing <laughs> and i was really so happy about that and it was it was a wonderful interview <clears throat> I have one. Well, Liz, did you have another question? question? Yes. Um, Kathy is asking, how do you keep people from touching the minerals in the gallery? Okay, so all the minerals are in cases. It's really easy. Everything is behind glass. And, you know, with mineral collectors, that's not a problem. But yes, with the general public, we have no choice but to keep almost everything behind glass simply because of uh, it, it would be very dangerous uh, for people to touch them, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's it. I have a few questions coming here and there, but uh, that's beautiful. I just love the way they're displayed. I just love it. You know, it puts everything in perspective and uh, yeah. So Alan Hart is asking uh, Madagascan tourmaline quartz mineral slice. Can we have a close up at it? Oh, the slice, sure. sure. Yes. Grab the camera. I was just gonna sit down and, but I will happy to leave. For Alan, I will do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, this is a this is from the largest liticotide slice that we know of. It's actually really, if you look at it, it's like two crystals together. And uh, this uh, was something that we bought uh, a while ago. We have a special slice collection. There's only five pieces. It consists of this uh, this piece of this liticotide, which is huge. I mean, I'll just put my hand next to it so you can see how big we're talking about. I mean, this thing has got to be uh, 18 inches, 17 inches tall. And then as part of the slice collection is also this rhodochrosite slice. Great. And uh, it's just incredible quality rhodochrosite slice. And this piece, the Smithsonian and the DuPont Museum, I believe is the DuPont Museum, have the slice before it and after it. In fact, I think maybe, and, and Eloise would know, I think the Museum of Natural History in Paris ha also has a slice from the same piece. John Carlo's online, so maybe he can respond. Yeah, John Carlo, John Carlo, if you are with us, can you just like let us know if you have a piece of I like a slice of the same? I think he has, I think they may have the same slice, yes. Mm -hmm. We'll see if he answers, I will let you know. Okay, and then the, uh, one more slice is on display, which is a piece from the Congo, which mixes uh, azurite, malachite, and chrysocolla. Um, and then we do have two other slices that are not on display at the moment, but they will be in the future. Excellent. And this is and, uh, our John collection. Keller is confirming, John Keller is confirming that they have uh, the, another slice of the same piece. They do, yeah, I oh, thought so. Right. And the Smithsonian has one, we have one, and I'm almost positive that the DuPont collection has one. Mm -hmm. And, and at the same the time, can we, can we ask you how you make the base of the minerals that you have here on display? 
so so uh, this base you see that this piece is on was made by the Sunnywood collection, which most people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we also these this piece, which is uh, being held by um, it's it's sitting in a cradle that's made custom made for this piece. Uh, this is made by a company in New Jersey that does displays. I can't recall their name, honestly, but they make this kind of display where you can custom make it with an iron uh, uh, cradle that holds the piece. So we use both. We use Sunnywood bases on most things, and then occasionally we will use this other company that makes custom bases. Yeah, that looks really stunning. Beautiful. And a you. lot of people uh, comment on the, the cases that you have and everything looks really great. Uh, and I'm sorry, George, we didn't uh, answer your questions regarding uh, fluorescent minerals. We uh, answered regarding fluid inclusions, but not fluorescent minerals. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that is something that we don't do. Uh, honestly, that's such a very specialized uh, aspect of mineral collecting. Even though I live very close to Fluorescent Central, Franklin, New Jersey. Uh, no, we have never done fluorescent minerals. Okay, and I guess I am, that answers all the questions that we have. Okay. okay then we're, it's a perfect time for the poll. So we're about to launch into the uh, five random questions that I'm gonna ask you. Okay. All the viewers have already answered this question. All of your answers are correct. We just wanna see if the viewers can get, can get close to what you're gonna answer. Okay. Um, but do we want to do the giveaway now or afterwards? Whatever you would like. I mean, here's the catalog. We'd like to uh, say that um, me and my son Troy and I uh, will sign a catalog for anyone who would like it wins your your contest. And in fact, uh, we can have the uh, everyone who works here sign it, uh, and then you can have a complete set. All right. So there. I guess we're doing the uh, uh, the giveaway first. So um, we're going to have a giveaway. Let's actually give away two prizes, okay? First is going to be the contrast catalog. The other one will be, is it the colors underground? Uh, underground hues. Well, you got it close there, Brian. We're close. Underground hues, okay. I'm, I'm in the ballpark. Okay, so it's going to, the, uh, the contrast catalog will go to the sixth person who answers this question correctly because this is, uh, episode 36, and then the underground hues will go to the ninth person with the correct answer because 36, add the three and the six and got nine. So it's gonna be the sixth correct answer and the ninth correct answer. And both those catalogs will be signed by everybody there at the gallery, including Evan, the photographer. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, no, these okay. are, these so are photos, he needs to sign it, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. so. Here's how, here's what you have to respond to, okay? You go to the Walensky Exquisite Minerals. I got it right on the title oh, of this yeah. slide. Exquisite Minerals, uh, walenskyminerals.com. And within that website, you have to name the variety of the mineral. And this isn't like, for example, uh, the answer barrel wouldn't be correct. You have to be more specific. You have to say if it's uh, an emerald or an aquamarine or a heliodor. So it's the variety of mineral on the main page of the Quartz Unrivaled Exhibition. So everyone go look at that. As we're doing that, Stu, you and I are going to go through the five questions. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Question number one, who shot first? Han or Greedo? Oh, not a clue. <laughs> you got a uh, guess. Greedo, Greedo. Greedo, okay. You would Question number two. I, but I don't. Okay, well, it's just your first reaction or maybe Troy's first reaction as was in this case. No, he doesn't know it either. No, but if, uh, if Connor were here, my younger son, he would have known exactly. He would have known immediately. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, then your answer is still Greedo. Okay. Question number two. Movie collectibles or fall cards? Movie collectibles. <laughs> that is what I predicted you'd say. Okay. Question number three. I'm actually curious about this answer. Ectachrome or Fujichrome? You know, that's a great question. I have to go with Ectachrome uh, for sure. Ectachrome. Yeah. For me, that was always... The, the the film of choice. Right now, let me ask you. Uh, 
uh, unrelated, was it Ektachrome that you'd shoot with or would you ever shoot with Kodachrome? I shot with color chrome. I shot with ectochrome. I would pick ectochrome. Okay. All right. And, and of course, you okay. know, I would say half the audience has never even heard of what we're talking about, you know. Totally. I know. I know. But uh, you, uh, you're a passionate uh, photographer, and uh, as was I for a while. Uh, question number four, Marvel or DC? Wow. I think, I think Marvel. Yeah, Marvel. Marvel? Yeah. And the final question, and I think this is a dead giveaway for anyone who's visited you up at the Westward Look, Godiva or Lint? Oh, Lint, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Eloise, are you ready with the answers? Okay, I guess I, I am. Okay. And I question think number that one, who shot was, first? I'm sorry, go I'm ahead. Sorry, what was yes. that? Okay. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one, who shot first? And well, uh, Stuart said well, Guido. I, I agree with the, the, the viewers. They answered Han Solo. So not agreeing with Stuart. Okay. All right. Well, Stu has all the right answers. Uh, question yep. number two, movie collectibles or baseball cards? We have movie collectibles here. Wow. People know Stu. Stu, you want to tell them quickly what that means? So for many years, like 20 years, I collected movie props, original authentic movie props. And uh, I actually was very big into Star Wars props. I owned an original uh, Darth Vader helmet, one of the few in private hands in the world. And I was very proud of my collection. It took up probably uh, a third of my home. And honestly, when we decided to open the gallery, um, this gallery needed a huge infusion of, of funds to, to, to build it and to, to open it. So I said, well, it's time to sell the, the prop collection. And I did. I sold the prop collection through a company in London called the Prop Store of London. They're very nice people, and I like them very much. And you can look at their, their website online. And, yeah, I, I absolutely am passionate about movie collectibles. Uh, my favorite movie that I collected was Terminator, not Star Wars, although I did love Star Wars. And I still have a few pieces from that collection that I kept for myself, which I don't have here to show you, but someday we will. Wow, I, I knew that you're a movie uh, um, collectible, but I didn't know that you sold the collection to help pay for the I did. gallery. I felt that, that the gallery is so important to the, our future, and I really do believe the future of mineral collecting, that for me it was worth the sacrifice. Wow. Um, so I, the Wolinsky Gallery is truly the gallery that is built on the helmet of Darth. The helmet of Darth Vader, the hat of Harrison Ford. I had Harrison Ford's original hat from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. Uh, I had uh, many pieces from Back to the Future. Um, it was a great collection. That's a, that's a talk for another day, but it's a, it was a great collection. And you don't know who shot first. Come I don't. No, that's the worst part. I don't. No, no, I don't. <laughs> Eloise is so disappointed in you, Stu. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I, one of the reasons, that maybe the main reason I collected movie props, aside from my interest in them, and I, I was passionate about it, is I don't collect minerals. I can't collect minerals any longer. I think I explained this to Brian. At some point in time, either you're going to be a dealer or you're going to be a collector. And I had to make that decision. So I love collecting. So I collected movie props. And now I actually collect uh, antique toys. That's my passion now. Antique toys? Antique toys and also antiquities, which you may see behind me a couple of my antiquities. I think you were covering the microphone with the... Um, yeah, something uh, happened with the audio there. It wasn't... But that's fine. We heard it. Okay. Okay. So it's... Um, it's antique toys and antiquities that are in the background is what uh, Stuart said. Okay. All right. I think we're starting to have audio problems here with uh, Stu. So let's go on Eloise with question number three, ectochrome or Fujichrome. Stu went with ectochrome. What did the audience say? And the audience as well. Ectochrome, indeed. Cool. Good deal. Good old E6 processes. We love those. Question number four, Marvel or DC? Stu went with Marvel. What did the audience say? The audience went for Marvel as well. And I can't blame them. Even okay. if I'm wearing so the So we've got three out of four. 
Final one, this is really just, this is a giveaway. Godiva or Lynn? Come on, that was not easy. Um, people answered, the public answered Godiva. Oh, sorry, Godiva. Godiva. Anyone who visits Stuart, well, I won't say anyone. I'll say I know this through ex years of experience of having um, Wilbur in Walensky's room and him stuffing his pockets full yes. of those. We have to control the from taking too many. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We, I think one point we almost tackled him because he kept stuffing his, <laughs> his pockets with these. And what you don't know, Brian, is that when you would leave, he'd come back at some point during the day and grab some more. I'm not surprised. I'd probably say, okay, uh, Dave, we're going to take a quick break. I got to go check on an interview. And he probably snuck back. Oh, look, you have some chocolate. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, uh, so Stu, we have the two winners. We have Dan M, who answered uh, correctly. The answer was Amethyst. And he was the sixth one to answer. And Roy Starkey was the ninth one to answer. So Dan will get the uh, the contrast catalog and Roy will get the underground Hughes catalog. And Stu, so can you, um, what is your email? Maybe you can state your email and then they'll just contact you directly. Sure, you know, it would be easiest to email it back to info at walenskyminerals.com. Info, I-N-F-O at walenskyminerals.com. And actually, you can just go to the website and send it from the website. It's very easy. Um, and, and send us an email with your uh, name and address, and we will happily send you the catalog. Wonderful. And for those who might not be able to hear that, it was info at walenskyminerals.com. Uh, Dan and Roy, uh, please uh, email Stu directly there. Or if for some reason that's not working, you can go to the website and contact him via the website. So. I think that's going to do it for today's show. Stuart, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and joining us here on Mineral Talks Live. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, Eloise. It was great doing this. Appreciate it, too. Thank you we very really much, Stuart and the right. Thank you. And for all of you viewers up, for all of you viewers out there, thank you again for tuning into our program. Uh, check back tomorrow on Blue Cat Productions' YouTube channel. And we're going to have the episode that we filmed back on February 3rd with Federico Pizzotta online. And just so that everybody knows, I know I kind of goofed up. Uh, we made two announcements that Scoville's interview would go online, and then I forgot to post it. So that's why we did the double announcement. So we're, we actually have three shows in the can now that will be coming out weekly. So uh, we're just going to pick it up again with uh, Federico's uh, interview that will go live tomorrow on the Blue Cat Productions YouTube channel. We will uh, put notifications up on our Facebook pages, as well as the Mineral Talks Live Facebook page. And ladies and gentlemen, tune in next week. We are very happy to have Dr. Bruce Karen Cross, a professor of geology from the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, being on our show next week. That's one week from today, Wednesday, March 3rd. Please come back. Join us then. For everyone, have a fantastic week. Mahalo for joining us. Aloha. Yeah, I think that Rekha and I are very excited about next week's program as well. So looking forward to see you all. Thank you again to this uh, week team for this great program. Thanks for the beautiful display, beautiful specimens. See you soon.